My name is Russ Darren, the Director of Education at Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. And the topic uh, we're going to talk about now is taking charge of epilepsy, practical tips for successful management. So we just heard a great lecture on research and what's on the horizon. Now we're going to kind of talk about what do you do in the meantime? How do you manage your epilepsy in the meantime? So uh, we're very fortunate to have with us a great panel of, of experts. Um, we have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Lorlesi, who's with the Michigan, uh, she's a pediatric neurologist with the Michigan Institute for Neurological Disorders. Uh, Dr. Amir Abukazim, Abu who's uh, an adult epileptologist with uh, St. John Providence Health System. And then also Kristen, or sorry, Taylor and Kristen Seitzma, who are a uh, mother and daughter who both have epilepsy and are going to share their experiences in managing that condition. Um, so, first of all, I'd just like uh, the panelists to just introduce themselves a little bit, talk a little bit about uh, your experience with epilepsy, and then we'll get into some of the issues. Okay, so um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, I've always had an interest in epilepsy from the very start of medical school. When I started to practice, um, my practice is 100% pediatric neurology. And uh, I would say that most of it, not uh, 75% of it, is really dedicated to pediatric epilepsy. Um, it's been a journey. I think that uh, even in my short time with my training, I've seen the advances, uh, at least with newer medications and other options surgically that have been um, newer and available, but it still remains a challenge. Um, and so I feel that we are very much up to it. And uh, again, thank you for hoping we can be helpful today. Uh, I can tell you my experience with epilepsy. First exposure was in my second year of medical school. Heard the lecture, first time heard, heard about the, the topic, etched in my mind since um, my only question for the lecture was, is this treatable? And my colleagues looked at me and said, very nice question, excellent question. Um, since then, I'm here. I did my training in town. I'm an epileptologist practicing at the St. John Providence Health System. I'm the director of the Epilepsy Monitoring Unit. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be invited today. Hi, I'm Taylor Seitzma. I am a senior at East Grand Rapids High School in Grand Rapids. Yeah. Um, there you go. I, and I was just accepted in Green Valley State University. I don't know what I want to study yet. I'm thinking about business, medicine, and teaching all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy singing in my church youth band, um, volunteering and helping the homeless in our community. And I enjoy drama. And yeah, <laughs> I've had epilepsy since fourth grade. I started with petty mom seizures, and in middle school I started having grand mom seizures in my sleep, and they slowly started happening during the day, uh, during my school day, actually. Um, and they ended December 21st, um, sophomore year. So I've been about two years seizure free, and I got my permit last year. So. My name is Kristen Seitzma. I'm Taylor's mom. I am um, originally from Columbus, Ohio. I met my wonderful husband over here, Michael, and my university. Graduated with a business degree in marketing, worked in marketing um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and um, have three wonderful kids. Uh, Turner said, no, my son is over there, with our 10 year old daughter is at camp this weekend, and she would be here. Um, I volunteer also in the, working with the homeless community and also uh, with the schools. I started having seizures. Uh, actually, Michael was with my, at my first one in college when I was 21, had another one at 23 another one at 27, and then after the birth of my third child, had them approximately uh, every three weeks for a while, and uh, spent seven years trying to find a way to figure out the chemicals to, to 
work in my brain to get them to stop. Um, spent seven years not driving. Um, you all have been there. Here at a large thump in the room. Everybody comes running. Oh, I just dropped something. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, that kind of fear in our, in our family. Um, but I've been five years since you have We found the right chemical. And um, it's, 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 it's like a team of people. It's like a team of doctors. A team of um, a lot of people working together research on our part. And um, we worked it out. There's a lot of hope. And um, we're happy to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Great, great. So I want to start out with a question for uh, Dr. Abakazan and Dr. Lassi. Um Obviously, you can't know what your patient, everything your patients do after they leave the office. Um, but if you can talk a little bit about what some of the key characteristics and behaviors are in patients who successfully manage their epilepsy, what are some of the things that stand out to you that um, help people to successfully manage their condition? <clears throat> so just to comment first, I think the word team really is the key, and that is when we leave the office visit, we have a game plan. This is very much a team approach. I think it's reasonable to expect, and of course being a pediatric neurologist, it involves the whole family, not just my patient, but just typically obviously the child, but also the mom, the dad, the extended family too. Everyone really should be on board. Everyone should understand what the dosing is, the medication name, um, the timing, if not medication, vagal nerve stimulator, then what are the uh, parameters, um, when to uh, call. And we would typically want to be aware if someone is breaking through with a seizure so we can best address the problem. So open line of communication within the team is very important. If there's questions, please let us know, even if you just left the office. You know, it's better to get that cleared up right away than to wait. Um, but essentially, the view of us working together is the key. Um, and so, yes, you're right, we can't know everything when we leave, but I think that I have a reasonable expectation that we understand what the game plan is and how we move forward from there up to the next visit. From my adult population patient, my my perspective on this topic would be educating the patient and their family. It's always better when the patient comes to the office with a family member. It helps me understand better the perspective of the observer of a seizure event, makes me understand what's going on, and puts two sets of ears to listen to what the discussion is. Bottom line is educating them and put the expectation in, in full view for, for the entire team how we're going to approach this. From starting medication, what to expect from a medication, what the occasional occurrence of a rash, allergy, the expectation of side effects, give them the spectrum of what's available to treat their seizures and drop the hint that surgery may be something to consider if, if medication fail. Um, and we create this, this channel of communication back and forth to raise the level of compliance and make them more accepting of the medication. Right. So, so it sounds like communication and having a strong partnership with the healthcare team is essential. Can you talk about any other behaviors in the patient and in the family uh, that you've noticed that really contribute to successful seizure control and managing the condition? I I, I see the level of engagement of the family and the patient themselves raise the, the chances for successful treatment. On occasions, uh, I see patients who the, the family structure may not be at optimum. I see sometimes patients with head injuries. They may not be very focused on, on grasping the idea of treatment. Uh, it put a limitation on, on compliance and success the treatment, and I see these things and foresee the potential risk, and I try to overcome them as much as possible by, again, educating <laughs> patients and their family. Let me just comment that organization is key. So um, having, um, obviously, the child will usually be present, present with a family member, but even more within that family to come to the appointment is very helpful. Um, 
writing things down. Uh, so I try to write things down as far as for schedules for patients, but it's helpful to take notes. Um, keeping things organized when your lab work was completed, where your lab work was completed, how can we um, make sure that we get the report. Every doctor will be different. I tend to ask my patients to call me within a certain amount of time after a test has been completed. That way I know if it didn't land on my desk for some reason, we're both looking for the report and nothing falls through the cracks. So working together is very important. These things I've seen has been a benefit for those um, with more successful management of their epilepsy. Um, parents get a binder. Um, you know, I know we have got smartphones these days, which is great, and I'm sure that there's going to be more and more applications, but nothing beats a good three ring binder with sections, uh, 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 you know, with clinic notes, request your clinic notes, request your imaging studies, request your CDs when you go have a picture taken, say it's an MRI, whatnot. Um, write down the names of your medications, where you get them filled. It seems a little bit overdone, but, and you may think, oh my gosh, I'm going to show up with this big binder, what's she going to say? She's going to say, yay, because now I have everything at my fingertips and we can really get some help moving. It actually hurts. I don't know. I, because I can't keep track of things to talk about memory, because I'm a person with epilepsy and I'm caring for somebody with epilepsy. I have some memory issues, so I put a spreadsheet um, that showed in red on one column the days that she had seizures, um, and then what we did to change it the time of day, what happened on those seizures, and then we had um, medications and anything that the doctor had said, and it goes page to page, so I can, it's a quick reference sheet, it's not huge, but it's something that I can take to every doctor's appointment and, and go, this is the history of what Taylor's seizure life looked like, not her real life, but her seizure life looks like. So um, it was a quick reference guide. And on our calendar at home, I always had to have a calendar on the wall, something tactile I could touch, I could see. And we would have, um, unfortunately for a while, I would have an S with a circle around it that would be the day that I had a seizure. If there was a day that she had a seizure, it would be an S with a T next to it. And that would be the day that she had a seizure and the time that it happened, how long it lasted, what time of day. So if there's a pattern at all, and we also record our menstrual cycle. Sorry, gentlemen, but we would record that too, because if that had anything to do, we had to try and find a pattern and a plan, because that's how you get involved to have a plan of action, because you, the doctor's not going to know you and what you do in your life and what happens unless you report it, you have it down, and especially if you have any kind of memory issues, you have to have it in front of you written down and so when you go into that meeting, you can go here. This is what it is, and it can trigger information for you to be able to have that discussion. Excellent. Right, and, and Kristen and Taylor, did you want to talk any more about any other behaviors or lifestyle choices or, or that type of thing that really con contributed to your success? In managing the family. <laughs> okay. Um, well, my mom has epilepsy and she actually had it before I did. So, so you cared for somebody who's so I cared for her while she had epilepsy for a while. And um, it kind of helped when I started having epilepsy because I wasn't as scared of it because I saw my mom go through it and saw her going through it and I helped her through it. And what helps a lot in the family is communication. Um, my brother and my dad and my little sister, we had to work through um, uh, protocol. If my mom had a seizure, we had to sure that she was okay if she had hurt her head or um, if she was bleeding. We had to make sure that we put pressure to the wound or call dad. If it was really, really bad, call 911. I tend to fall like a tree. I'm six foot two. We have a lot of hardwood floors. Uh, not always very good. <laughs> a lot of stitches, a lot of staples. She was Yeah, I'm right. She's great. Great. Okay. Um, but the communication helped a lot. You got to a point where if somebody had a seizure, there was a rhythm, 
there, it wasn't as scary, it wasn't as frightening. Once I started having seizures, um, everybody knew what to do, at least in the family. The middle school didn't know what to do. You had to go into the middle school and tell them what to do. They actually kept the school on lockdown. Um, that wasn't a good um, But I believe that communication is a very critical key part of a family if you have epilepsy, or actually of any family, epilepsy or not. Um, also a sense of humor. <coughs> or at least for me. Because my freshman year was not great. I had really bad my epilepsy got worse my freshman year. I started I went in freshman year it's not great year anyway in high school, I, I must say. But then you go in and you have start having seizures in your classes and in the hallways. It's not fun. And you have to go in the next day and you have to keep your head held your head held high. And it was hard. So at home I just had a sense of humor about it. Because there's really my medications were just changing and there was, I could, there was nothing I could really do about it. So I laughed about it. And that's what worked for me. So it may not work for you, but that's what helped me get through it. It was the best medicine. That was the best medicine. We did that. I think Phil this book does a beautiful job with cancer for that. They do a great job of laughing and helping people laugh. And um, I know we have a cold cancer run that goes by our house, and they wear underwear on their heads. Um, our, our boxers, when they do a run, and we thought that was a great way. It's a serious situation. Epilepsy is a serious situation for a lot of us, but um, if you can have a sense of humor um, and deal with things um, and laugh about the good parts of your life, too, it's very important. Um, for individually, for me, uh, not just within the family, uh, three things that were key for me to keep going about uh, faith, a strong faith um, that helped me get through. Uh, also kept perspective on um, things. I did focus on myself. I'm a person with epilepsy. Person first. The P is always before the E. E is not as big as the P. Always remember that. So I'm a person with gifts and talents. Epilepsy is just part of it. So I always remember that you go out into the world and bring those gifts and talents. Out. Whether um, I am stuck at home, I cannot drive, I can still use whatever gifts and talents I have. I just have to be a little more creative. Well, you know, I, use I live in a walkable community, um, but there are a lot of people that don't. So you have to find a way to be able to do that. But you are able to do, um, maybe it's phone calls, maybe it's take it. Whatever you can do, write a letter to people um, to give them encouragement that you need to focus outside of yourself. Because if you focus on the E <coughs> instead of the P, um, you can a lot of times spiral into a lot of drama uh, of your own. And I've done that too. You throw yourself a pity party. I threw myself plenty of pity parties. And sometimes that's okay. Um, but if you dwell on the pity party, it can be overwhelming. Um, but part of that faith and perspective also helps me to always have a plan. If I didn't have a plan, um, counting on my calendar, knowing that, okay, have I made it to a month yet without a seizure? Have I made it to that critical six months without a seizure? Um, you always gotta have another step. Okay, if this medication plan doesn't work, what's my next step? You always have to have that next step available to you. Don't go, okay, this is the only thing I have available. You have lots of choices available to you. Always work with that team of people to go, okay, if this doesn't work, what's the next available thing? Because if you don't have that, you start to lose hope. And you never, ever lose hope. Because there's always another option for you. Right, thanks. Okay. So uh, getting back to um, the, the doctor-patient relationship and how important that is. Um, can, can anyone share um, what you think the, the responsibilities of the neurologist should be in terms of what information is provided, uh, how much time they spend, how you, when and how you can contact them? What, what's a, a reasonable expectation of, the, of, of what a neurologist should provide? And, and the neurologist can talk about this too, please. Um, I had a great experience with a neurologist actually in Eastside State here. 
Um, we can email. I am not really good at communicating one on one. If you barrage me with questions like Ross is doing right now, if you, if, if you, if in a doctor's situation, if you're asking a lot of questions, I usually need time to process because my brain's just not working that fast. Um, but I'll leave the office and go, oh, I wish I would have asked that question. Even if I have questions that I wrote down and I don't get through them all, um, she would let me email her. And it wasn't her personal email, it was her work email. And I'm much better when I can type and write it out and then be able to read it and understand it and then email back. It was a really great relationship that we could have because it allowed me to process and go back and forth with an email relationship because a lot of times I couldn't think that quickly and go back and forth. So that was a huge help for us. Anyone else? In my case, again, I make myself available to my patients. If there is an emergency, I can be disrupted to answer for an emergency. For the most part, I answer my phone calls at the end of the day, and I keep myself available even on weekend call. Um, again, each phone call, it is a piece of educating the patient on what to expect with every change in the dosing or timing of the medication, I tell them what to expect as far as side effects, and the more they are knowledgeable, the, the better their care and the expectations are. Yeah. I think that again, the open lines of communication are very important. Uh, I like the idea of again writing things down. Um, yes, we've got more modern technology with email, and um, although I personally, in my practice, I do like talking to people, um, but typically that may be a little easier in the sense that the parents generally may or may not have, of course, epilepsy. So writing things down and then giving me a call, I like to speak to people, because I feel that um, I can usually, I can think a little bit better from that end. But, um, you know, every neurologist would be a little bit different. I think the expectation should be that we answer all your questions as much as we can. There will be questions that we certainly can't answer, but having that game plan, knowing what A, B, and C are going to be, and it is very important that we elaborate and say, okay, we're going to start you on this medicine and that's it. Well, no. <laughs> or we may we're going to start this medication. If this does not work, what's plan B? What's plan C, D? And many of us would be happy to go through all the way to Z if we wanted to hear that. But again, it's never just one thing. We can come at this situation from multiple angles, and it's very important to say, yes, there is no reason to lose hope. There's lots that we can do. And if one, your neurologist himself can't do that, we extend out and we have tertiary epilepsy centers, Cleveland, for example, that we can extend to, and we all work as a team. Also, the whole bunch of papers that you fill out before going to the doctor's office. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I would assume so you do. Um, when you go into the doctor's office and you took all that time filling out those papers about when your last seizure was, when did it all start, um, all the medications you're taking, if you're taking medications, and then they ask you those questions once you've given them that sheet. It'd be great if they would either read the sheet or if you didn't have to fill out the paper. <laughs> so they come in with this. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Yeah. And may I respond? May I respond? May I respond? No. I'm sorry, um, we have to move on. Just, just, no, just kidding. Um, I, I think that, you know, it, it, coming at this and saying, you know, yes, I'm going to give you all the, you know, it's like a tone, right? You're right. It's like this bit, it's this bit. Um, the, the reason, of course, is you guys well know why we would ask that is that it's nice to have it written down, one, number one, and it's nice to have as a reference, number two. But it's also wise that I try with my families to say, I know you've said all this before, and I know that you've written all this down, and I will flip through that, and I will go through that. But there's nothing like hearing the story for the first time, with straight out of the person's mind. And things that I read might be misconstrued. I may think of something completely different in how something was great. So the best, I believe, is the combo of both of those. So getting that insight, that information from you, and then hearing from you 
I believe feels that fits the best of both worlds. So there's my response. <laughs> but, it, it is, but it would be nice if all doctors would say, I know you've said this before. <laughs> so I hear you. Okay, so, so we've talked a little bit about neurologist responsibilities, but what are some of the key responsibilities of the patients? And what, what are the things that you need to, the patients need to provide their doctor uh, in order to have, to be a successful team? It's for anyone who wants to come up. Yeah. Um, I think we need to, it's our responsibility, like I said before, that you know your body, you know your symptoms, you know your daily activities, you know what your goals are. Your goal may be to be completely seizure-free for some people. It may just to be go from eight seizures a day to one seizure a day. You know what your personal goals are and set that goal. You, um, you want to um, you know what your patterns are and you know you need to be responsible to make sure that that doctor knows that. And um, it could be an allergy to peanuts that you're not aware of. It, you write down absolutely every piece of information that that doctor may be able to use and, um, and give that to them because they need that information. And that is your responsibility. You can't go in there and say, I had a seizure last week and a seizure this week. Fix it. They're not going to be able to do that without knowing every piece of information that you've got. So. To, to that, I concur that I would like to listen to the patient's description of events, and sometimes I interrupt them to extract more information that helps me understand and it helps me redirect the treatment. Uh, it's very crucial to listen face to face to have that face to face meeting to better provide the care and deliver. <laughs> we don't know, we can't help. Um, so, you know, people say, do I call again? Yes, you do call again. We want to know if you've broken through, if you're having problems with your meds, if the child is having difficulty in school. If, are there issues from an education perspective that we need to be aware of? Do we need to be contacting the teachers? There's something else that needs to be in the individual educational plan. We want to know. And, uh, and it, it, it's, it's very helpful to get that open line of communication. We try and keep that open as much as possible. Is it perfect? No. But I think that the, as long as we both have that open line, it works for us. I have a friend who has a child who has seizures not as often, and she was concerned about calling the doctor because they had just changed medications or upped his medication. And she said, well, he doesn't have them as often as somebody else might at the office. And I said, well, no, you, you need to call in because that doesn't matter that somebody else is having them more. It is not, it is unusual for him. He's not having that. You absolutely need to make that appointment. So, call, yeah. call. Okay, so uh, for, for many people, managing seizures is just one part of managing epilepsy. Um, sometimes it can be even more difficult managing other aspects like memory problems or depression or transportation difficulties, employment, school problems, you name it. So, so we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about some of those issues. Um, let's start out with medication side effects. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, when you have medication side effects, you, you then face a choice. What do, we, what do we do now? I'm experiencing these side effects. Do we um, switch medications and possibly get rid of those side effects, but then also risk getting new side effects or having uh, more seizures? Uh, do we lower the dosage? If those side effects are dose-related, we might be able to reduce them just simply by lowering the dosage, but then there's a risk of more seizures. Do we just try to manage the existing side effects and, and what are some strategies for doing that? Can you talk a little bit about how you make those choices as a, as a neurologist and as a patient? Side effects as the uh, NEMA, it's a side effects expected kind of side effects of the antiepileptic drugs. There are the sedating side effects, the central nervous system side effects of uh, dizziness, double vision, imbalance. Uh, these are associated with every antiepileptic drug. And we try to minimize the impact of an antiepileptic drug on the central nervous system by modifying either the dosages, by reducing the dose, or staggering the, the uh, administration of the medication, and sometimes splitting the medication from being twice a day to three times a day that can help. We try to do the best we can to get the most out of a medication before switching 
because there is no way to predict what the next medication may do, whether a person may be allergic to the drug or may not be responding to the drug at all. If this, if all these modifications fail, then we'll talk about adding another medication and withdrawing the first drug. And with the addition of another medication, there's always the risk of having more side effects in the, in the interim of the switch. So it is a matter of fine-tuning the, the treatment and, again, educating the patient to what to expect with every step, every change we make. I would echo that certainly, and that everyone is an individual, and everyone's epilepsy is individual. And uh, we, we need, as I believe, as physicians take into account, no matter what issue that we're facing. And uh, we need to keep that open line of communication open. Generally, I would agree, we would try to tolerate as much as possible with medication, but adjustments certainly can be made. And not necessarily to the detriment um, with causing more seizures. Okay, so. Um, keep that conversation with your neurologist, talk to them about it. Um, however, again, if you're feeling, and this goes out to the patient and the parent out there, if it's like, this, A, it's not working, you know, we're having more problems. I know we've only been on this for a couple weeks, but the warning sign, the first rule of pediatrics is that the parents are 99% right. Your second rule of pediatrics is that your nurse is 99% right, okay? so. I learned that long ago. So we listen, we, we have that conversation and we move forward with that. And the good news is we do have more options now than we've had in the past. So again, I can be a help. Between Taylor and I, we've probably taken a large portion of what is out there. Love of Carnitine, Tegretol, Keppra, Zeratin, Topamax, Depakote, Amectos, we got them all, uh, not all, but a lot of them. Um, actually, Taylor takes 22 pills a day. Um, not all of those are prescription, but um, let's see, for the Depakote that she takes, she takes three other prescriptions to negate the side effects of Depakote. The Depakote is the one that controls the seizures the most. Um, she has tertiary, and then how do you do it? No, it's the three drugs. She take three AEDs in order to control seizures. I need to take three AEDs to control seizures. They are different, but we're mother and daughter. So uh, we both take Topamax. Um, <laughs> Topamax has a little bit of memory issue, but we're all working with it. Um, with the memory issue with Topamax, I've used neurofeedback. Um, we both have. It is, I could read. I could not read and remember the characters from one page to five pages later. I would, I would write down the characters and then I would use it as a cheat sheet and I still couldn't remember. Um, neurofeedback worked for me. I, it allowed me after several sessions to be able to read novels and I'm not talking like technical stuff, I'm talking regular uh, mind candy kind of books. Um, and it helped me. We also did, uh, I did, I worked with an endocrinologist, nutritionist, we did um, acupuncture. I'm looking at Michael because he's usually my a memory card reader for those things. Your little, Yes. He's like my, my, my flash drive. I'm giving my words when I forget them. Um, we've tried the, what are the other ones? Oh, when we took Neurotin. We were working her up on Neurotin. Zeratin. 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 And she was just working up to it, but she was falling asleep, standing up in my hair. And um, she wasn't to the maximum dose yet. That's about halfway. Yeah. And, and the doctor said, hey, is it controlling her seizures? Yeah. Well, let's stop it halfway through. So we're not, we're not up to that maximum dose, but it's controlling the seizures. We're not up to the dose that we prescribed, but it's controlling the seizures. Well, let's stop it. And let's see what happens. And it, and it worked for a short period of time until she started getting the seizures. Mm -hmm. um, the big thing, though, is when you're on a drug and you start to have the the um, severe depression, and both of us had that on a medication that um, it, it was more than just, oh, I'm feeling low, or I feel good about myself. It got to the point of suicidal thoughts. And, um, you know, no, I'm gonna plow through it, I'm gonna make it through, because this one might be the one that controls my seizures. <clears throat> but if you get to that point, there are so many other drugs and things that you can work with combo, don't go there. So, um, we, I tried it for three months and was like, no, my doctor said, you should have called me two weeks, two months ago, as soon as you had those thoughts. So um, I recommend that that be the case, if anybody can do that. Um, and we did a bunch of vitamins, too. Yes. We went to a DO, um, 
and he, and again, part of our team, he said, here, fish oil, um, what's the, uh, turmeric, and we had all kinds of things that work for us, vitamin B, uh, vitamin E, uh, D, <laughs> We can blow out all the alphabets. Oh, no, that's to go tanning. We had a panel with D. Um, yeah, she, so there's, we worked with my OBGYN because it was, uh, I take progesterone to help with mine. And, um, I tried progesterone. That's progesterone not was not good for it her. Not good for me. So um, it, it's a combination. Everybody has their own little petri dish in their head. We're talking about um, everybody's epilepsy is different. My little petri dish is different than her petri dish and what chemicals we needed to mix together to make my epilepsy go away or subside is different than hers. And um, after five years of being seizure free, we're on that kind of line of, do I reduce some of this stuff? I've been on Dilantin for 20 years. When do I stop? Is it, is, is it do I continue doing it forever? Um, but I don't want to give up my keys for driving. Anytime I change my meds, I need to give up my keys. And I'm not ready to do that yet. So, um, I never want to take progesterone all the time. I feel like I'm pregnant all the time. Ladies in the audience, that's not So, um, you know, what do you do? It's important not to be having seizures, and that is what is important to me right now. But at some point, if I decide I've got other drivers in the house, and um, I'm going to give those keys up for a while, I'm going to change things up. If the side effects are worse than the benefit of not having seizures, we might do that. Taylor saying, like, she might reduce some token match. She's going to college. It's hard to take exams. Um, Dr. Arndt said, you know what? Two years seizure free, let's look at reducing something because you got to give up your car Okay. So a lot of it depends on what stage of your life you're at. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a constant process and, and, and persistence is important to what it sounds like. Um, so um, let's talk about memory problems, which we mentioned a few times already. Um, and can, can everyone give some a, a few examples of some strategies or interventions that have worked particularly well for you, um, either with your patients or using them yourself? Well, this year, I did calculus, and I can't memorize anymore. It just it doesn't work. I'm on Topamax, and it's just very difficult to memorize things. I have a difficult time remembering what I did yesterday. So memorizing formulas and memorizing anything in calculus or any other class is very difficult for me. So to get through it, I have to instead be able to completely understand it and be able to know how the functions where they come from and and derive the formulas, which is not as easy as memorizing it. I'd much rather be able to memorize it. Yeah, I'd much rather be able to memorize it. Do you see it? I do, I see the formulas. Yeah, but yeah. You sing, you sing to figure out memorizing. I, I sing to memorize the functions. I actually have a calculus for dummies. But it's great. I read it in my spare time. But that, that's how I have to get over memorizing because I can't memorize anymore. Anyone else have any strategies that you found particularly helpful in, in managing or even improving memory function? In my adult population, and sometimes I have older adults who I take care of, I recommend what we recommend for all of us. Be more active, more engaged, be involved with social activities and have the family be more engaged in, in working with, with the person with epilepsy to keep them stimulated. It's general rule of thumb. Sedentary lifestyle is not good for the body nor the mind. And, and I try to emphasize that with all of my patients, whether they have epilepsy or other neurologic condition or healthy individuals. So common sense of what to do to keep the person engaged. Absolutely, I echo that, but um, also from a, uh, from a pediatric standpoint, uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, obviously, your commentary there, too, in your experience with school, um, this is often a component to our treatment plan is the academic portion and how that child is doing well in school. 
and most of my patients will have an individual educational plan or IEP or a final for the plan in place. It's important, I feel, although I'm not an educator, full disclosure, I'm a doctor, um, that we give our um, flavor to what teachers should be aware of, educators should be aware of, and warning signs that we would want to know about first. Um, uh, athletic, uh, when athletes are involved, what are some of the issues that we have to look out for with those who are having seizures, medication side effects. Um, so it's important that we get that feedback from the school educators as well. I, I firmly believe they're part of the team, certainly in, in the population that I serve. Okay. Um, <clears throat> also mentioned depression, and uh, along with that fear, fear of having a seizure, fear of the unknown, the, un the inherent unpredictability of epilepsy, and then anxiety and stress. Um, those are very common feelings uh, among people with epilepsy, even if the seizures are well controlled. Uh, and uh, fear in particular, even if your seizures are well controlled, you may be constantly worried about when is that next shoe going to drop. So, um, we obviously you want to seek professional help if it gets to the point that you were talking about, Kristen, where uh, you're having thoughts of suicide or it's really in interrupting your daily functions. But how do you manage it just on a day-to-day -day basis? How do you keep that depression, the fear, and the anxiety at bay? Um. I, I think that from a day-to-day -day basis, if you can get yourself away from thinking about yourself and thinking about epilepsy, and get out and help others, and get out into the community and help people around you, and you can see that other people are going through a tough time, and it's not just you. It's not just yourself that's going through a hard time. And you can see that other people, they're going through homelessness, they're going through hunger, they're going through divorces, they're going through many other horrible things. And it's not just you. And you can understand that, and you can get away from yourself. And it'll help you get a better understanding. And that's, it makes it a lot easier to just, if you're not focusing on it, and then you don't go into a spiral down and you're not centered around yourself, you're centered around others. It helps you getting involved with the foundation and knowing that you're not alone. I mean, we were together, so we knew we weren't alone, but to know that there are others out there who are going through the same thing, um, who have that same understanding that when you hear that loud phone for you, or you have that anxiety of the phone call, perhaps from the school, because you have to have a cell phone on you at all times. Um, those kinds of things, as a parent of a child with epilepsy, there are some things that we all have in common, but are not things that would uh, that inhibit us from doing things. That, that We can all appreciate that, but we can all also enjoy life, too. We just need to share those things, understand them, help each other out, give each other a hug, take a deep breath, and go, okay, we are out there, we can do this, now let's move on. And I've had that with um, neighbors who, who have kids with epilepsy or people that have epilepsy or living by themselves. And, um, you know, you check in on them because you're concerned, especially when you're by yourself, that, that you want to make sure you're okay. Anything else? Um, I, I, make sure you talk talking with your family, and I talk to my pediatric patients about that. It's important to use your words, you know, talk about your feelings, talk about how overwhelming things are, how things are manageable, um, how frustrating it is. And sometimes we will have um, some of our associates within child psychology and, and counseling um, work with the families, because they can be quite helpful. And although I would love to provide every single angle of care, uh, it's, as we've said before so many times, it is a team approach. So um, it, having that as an open option, too, is helpful. Mm -hmm. In addition, I would like to mention that treatment with medication with antidepressant drug is not uh, uncommon for my patients. I do sometimes start them on medication. And if, like any other patient who has depression, if we don't see a response, I always seek professional help from my colleague, my psychiatrist, uh, colleague. Okay. Okay.
Um, so you can do a great job of managing your own epilepsy. But, um, it's hard, it can be hard to manage the public's perception of epilepsy and how other people react to it. What are some things that, um, that you've done to, to let people other know, or let other people know about your epilepsy and manage their reactions to the epilepsy? Well, there's really nothing you can do about how they react except for uh, how you react. Like when you come back the next day to school, if you're acting sad and depressed and scared of uncomfortable. and uncomfortable of how other people are going to react and they're going to feel uncomfortable and sad and almost scared. But if you come in with your head held high and it is what it is, it is, what it is and you be you, it doesn't define you, then they're not going to think any, hopefully, any different of you because you are yourself and everybody has their, everybody has their problem. not problems, but everybody has their deal. And, and how do you, um, how do you, at what point, or how do you decide when to disclose epilepsy to people? <laughs> we um, had this discussion on the way to the way here. Taylor's like, she's going to college and we're going to have these three new roommates at Grand Valley. Um, when you bring that up, hi, my name is Taylor. I have epilepsy. Or do you wait and go, when is the right time? She's been almost, well, she will be hopefully two years plus without a seizure by the time she goes in fall of 2013. Um, I said, what is safe? We're going to talk about safety, but you need to let the RA know at least first thing that time. They need to know that you have epilepsy. You're taking all these pills every day. Your 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 roommates are going to figure it out after a while when you've got these chunks of pill boxes that you have with you that something's going on. Um, but it's not one of those things people are going to go oh and they'll be scared because you need to develop a relationship with people before you throw that at them because I think there'll be they'll associate you, they'll see the E before the P, they'll see the epilepsy before the person. So it, I think it's when you have that relationship with people, they'll see you as a human being, as a person with gifts and talents and all kinds of things. And then go, yeah, by the way, I do have epilepsy, just so you guys know, this is what it will look like, this is what happens if I have a seizure, and, and you kind of go through those basic safety precautions with them. Um, but I don't think it's something that you do without the relationship with the person first. Okay, uh, another um, <clears throat> a family issue that comes up often is, <clears throat> particularly with parents of children with epilepsy, is uh, balancing the, the need for independence and self-determination versus the need for safety. And uh, you want people to, to you know, uh, not take unnecessary risks, but you also want people to live their lives to the fullest. So how do you find that balance uh, as, as family members and then also as professionals, how do you counsel patients about risks associated with epilepsy without causing unnecessary fear? <clears throat> we discuss the, the common sense safety issues about obviously the driving for someone who just had a seizure and remind my patient about the rules of our Secretary of State. I make sure they know it's not me who's sticking them, it is because your state has those rules for their own safety and other others on the road. Uh, common safety rules is not to be swimming by yourself, unintended, or, or taking baths and not to climb at heights and operate machinery. Uh, to a certain degree, for those patients who have restricted seizures to nocturnal seizures, I tend to not restrict them from driving. Absolutely, there has never been documentation of. Uh, daytime seizure, or patients who have simple partial seizure without alteration awareness, they in my book, they can drive as long as I have documented that they have never had any more involved seizures leading to alteration in consciousness. Um, for other safety measures, again, not to take a bath by themselves and, and uh, for, for patients who have seizures with aura, prolonged aura, that may allow them to take action and to fall off the road if they're driving, I occasionally have a couple of patients who have done it, drive with rare seizures, and they have enough warning to, to allow them to not 
be more than the maximum. Yeah. So that counseling is <clears throat> very much on an individualized basis. Yeah. So. And as far as um, raising Taylor, how did how did you help to promote independence while also taking reasonable safety precautions? With any parent, you've got a child that's we're in a walkable district, so she has to walk to school um, along a busy road. We try to make it so that her she has a little bit of ego, so we had to be careful to not damage that ego, but put in some safety precautions. Um, she would always walk to school with, with friends, um, and those friends would flank her, usually on the street side, so she, we don't have wars, so we don't know when we're going to have them. Um, Taylor tends to crumple, which is good, she doesn't fall straight, but if she did fall, it potentially fall into the street. So um, we would make sure that we had somebody always walking with her, and at one point her brother walked with her, also came from school, so she was not by herself ever. Um, there was time when she was at the school and she was having so frequently that she needed to use the elevator instead of the stairs, because she would have a couple of seizures um, that were right after, I know she was not happy about that, uh, but she had to use the elevator key along with all the kids that broke their legs or anything like that, and they'd be like, why are you in the elevator? Uh, you know, just here, help me. Yeah, so. Um, that was not fun, but um, as she had done it for freshman year, she came home. We, we homeschooled her because it was nine weeks because it was dangerous enough for her at school um, and having her frequently enough that she needed to come home. Um, but there were also times where she was in Phantom of the Opera, the musical at the high school, and she was on stage, and that director said, okay, what's the protocol? What happens? Um, I need to let parents know if she has a seizure on stage, backstage. So we had Epilepsy 101 with parents, Stage managers, everybody, this is what happened, you roll over on your side, yada yada yada, we did all that. Um, so pretty much East Grand Rapids High School now has a protocol, middle school has a protocol. We did not want, we didn't need EMT call every time. You got Michael and I were very close um, in proximity, so we had a plan set up of how we wanted things handled. I think I highly recommend that for any parent who has a child with epilepsy. You work with the schools and say, unless she's injured or anything, please call me and let's get it taken care of. So all of her teachers every year would know, this is what happens, this is what it looks like. Um, they all say, oh my gosh, it lasts 20 minutes. No, it doesn't, it lasts a minute and a half. Uh, you all are gonna think it looks a lot, it lasts a lot longer because you're scared, don't worry about it. Um, and you just have to have those conversations with the adults that are gonna be taking care of. And give her a little bit of space. Don't put her on the third riser, please. Put her on the first riser when she's singing in the choir. Um, just those kinds of little things um, help you and allow her to have that freedom. Anytime she was swimming, um, I was there for a while on the side because I didn't trust the lifeguards. But I did let the lifeguards know at our <laughs> after club that she had epilepsy. She didn't know that. She didn't have that conversation. I had the conversation with the lifeguards. Um, but I sat at the side of the pool all the time um, until she was having a little less freedom. Um, she did not ride a bike again. It was a big deal. I jumped up. I didn't ride a bike for a long time. It was a big deal when I got to ride a bike. It's a big deal when she got to ride a bike. Um, and it's a big, bigger deal when she got to drive. So, um, I don't know, those are big accomplishments to be able to have to happen. And uh, in, in terms of uh, related to independence, how did you help to, or how do you promote uh, becoming a self advocate for, for your, your child? How do you help them to take an active role in managing their condition? You're honest with them. You go, this is what's going on in your brain. Um, and you, you can't talk down to them. Um, and obviously, when they're really young, you have to use words that they understand. Um, Ken Fawcett explained it to us really well. Um, he said, you're, there's a field. Your brain's like a field. Every time you have a seizure, um, it's like walking through that field. The more times you have a seizure, the more times you walk through that field. And it's easier for that seizure to happen. The less times you have seizures, that field grows up and it's harder for your brain to trigger through that and, and go through that field, harder to walk through it. So we used that to explain it to her when she was in fourth grade. Um, as she got older, we can explain it better. Taylor puts her own pills, and I'm going to her all put our pill packs together. And she does that with me. Um, she's going to go away to college. She's got to be able to figure that kind of stuff out. She understands the electro electrical storm in her brain. You have to have those conversations. Um, she gets involved with the Epilepsy Foundation, goes to Lansing, um, sees that there are other teens. We do the, the walk. Um, didn't have a lot of success with other teens of her friends getting involved. It was a little much for them. Uh, Taylor had a bit of a tough time with some peers. Uh, her dad's on the board of the Epilepsy Foundation. 
just got involved and said, this is important to us. And um, it's important that you have success. Okay, so that's what's good with success. Um, <laughs> so, and just talk really honestly with your kid. That's the best way to do it. Don't sugarcoat it. And just so, but also don't say there is no hope. Never tell your kid, hey, I'm sorry, this is just how it's going to be. Always say, you know what, we've got a plan. And we'll make this work or stand by you and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay. We'll figure out a way to walk you through this. No crying. No crying. No crying. <laughs> Dr. Olesi, did you have anything to add about, about promoting uh, the, uh, that kids playing an active role in their care? And, and, and at what point do you do that? You know, I, I think if I nodded more, my head would fall off. I know that's not actually possible physiologically, but I can't echo enough what everyone over there has been saying, and it's very important to be honest with your children and not to talk down to the children. When I see patients, I talk to my patients, whether they are two years old, three years old, five years old, 16, 17, 20, and upwards, it's important that we get their perspective, and kids know what's going on, okay? And it's, it's very important that we are honest, we are open, we use words that we can understand, we use analogies that we can all, you know, relate to, and that we you know we always think of function, not limitation. Um, I like it when kids are actively involved in sports and having those conversations with the coaches too. Uh, another point to talk about as well. Uh, you know, again, you can do all the sports you like, just wear the protective gear like anyone else. Learn the rules of the game. Um, be an active participant. Keep your head up. It's never a bad idea for any sport. Okay. Um, so, uh, no, we think of function, not limitation. And, uh, but again, I echo everything that's really been said from the fantastic mom and daughter team. <laughs> We, we talked a little bit about transportation and, and driving. Um, <clears throat> in terms of how you dealt with the inability to drive, now some, some people are fortunate to live in an area where there's good public transportation. Other people are fortunate enough to have really good family support and lots of people who can give rides. But that can be a, a real challenge uh, when, when one or more people are able to drive. How do you, how, how did, Kristen and Taylor, how did you deal with um, transportation? not being able to drive. Um, we were fortunate we lived in a walkable community. Okay. Um, and actually, before I was having a lot of seizures, I was marketing director for the transit authority in Grand Rapids, which is kind of But uh, I didn't use the bus then, so uh, was what I could drive. And then, um, so I did use the bus, and it's not a great transit system, but it, it works pretty well. And, um, but then when I was involved in church, I had a Bible study group of people, and I highly recommend it recommend. If you have any kind of faith-based organization or any kind of organization that you're involved in, you'll find that people want to take care of other people. Mm -hmm. And they did it in a great way in the fact that they did not talk down to me or, or think of me as handicapped or anything. I had a woman that said, hey, I'm going to Meyer. I go to Meyer on Monday. I go to Meyer on Monday. And if you want, I would love to just run by and pick you up because that's when I always go. And it was great because she didn't say, well, I will come by and I'll pick your little cell phone. You can't drive. And then I'll take you. And she didn't do it that way. She said, you know what? I'm just going to go by your house. I'll pick you up on Monday. This is when I go and I'll drop you off. And it was great. And it was because I had those relationships with people outside of my house. And, and it worked out really well. So I encourage just to have relationships outside. Um, be it in work, um, faith-based community, whatever. Um, get out there. Because there are people that really want to help others. And you have to talk about the fact that you do have epilepsy. Um, and show that you're vulnerable, and then others are going to say, hey, can I help you out somehow? That's what works for us. Great. Great. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about financial issues. Um, underemployment and unemployment is, is com more common among people with epilepsy, and uh, as, as a result, because our system is, uh, of insurance is largely employment-based, a lot of people either don't have insurance or they're underinsured have their insurance has limitations, they end up having large out-of-pocket costs. What are some ways to reduce costs uh, and increase access to specialty care for people who are either uninsured or underinsured? And then, um, if, if there are services that are needed but simply can't be paid for, um, or the out-of-pocket costs are just too big, how do you prioritize those services as a neurologist and as a uh, 
a patient um, and decide which you're going to get. We don't want to turn this into a political debate. I'm supportive of universal health care for the obvious reason you just mentioned. I do take care of my patient do the best I can with what, what resources they have. And I took care of individual for a good 10 years without taking an MRI of the brain because the lady had no insurance. I counted on my clinical flare, her exam was normal, procedures were controlled with a simple small dose of Tegretol. She occasionally had simple partial seizures, but we deferred taking the test for 10 years. If there was any hint of, of something seriously happening within, within her brain, I would be directing her to the emergency room and our hospital system is capable of taking care of individuals with the emergencies or bigger problems. So we prioritize what, how to allocate the resources as much as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot of uh, referral for, for uh, pharmaceutical based uh, assistance system for a a lot of forms and papers for patients to get the medication, the more expensive drugs as much as we can and help them with samples when these are available. I essentially would agree with the, um, again, the um, pharmaceutical colleagues in BioMars have been very helpful in, in um, helping us out with some of the more you know, expensive medications. Um, you know, children's special health care is something that can be used help for many children in Michigan. Um, and you have to have that party and everyone is different. Everyone has their own individual um, goals and needs, but if indeed somebody really needs something to be done, then it is urgent or emergent, and we will direct you to where you need to go to get it done. But um, uh, balance is important, and uh, we will prioritize as well. We had to take quite a few obviously meds. Uh, Taylor and I cannot take the generic of Tobamax because we have seizures on it. Um, on the generic form. So uh, for a while, we had to find a way to get Topamax. Um, we weren't insured for it. So we had to, uh, we, the, the onus is on you to find ways to get that medication. And sometimes you can go out of the country. Um, we had Topamax out of Canada for a while. Um, we got it out of Sweden for a while. Um, there are ways, the internet is a beautiful place. Um, it is the correct, it is the medication, it is, Written, it's the exact same medication that I get in the United States, um, and you just had to find it. And um, I wasn't going to be able to change it because topiramate was going to allow us to have seizures. So you just had to be creative. And um, sometimes you have to, to do that. And I would recommend that the onus is on you sometimes just to go and find it for yourselves and um, take care of yourself. Right, and, and certainly call the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan to have needs for that. <clears throat> Excuse me, we can't provide direct financial assistance, but we can help you with some of those strategies. Um, also, Children's Special Health Care Services, which you mentioned, is at, at our Health and uh, Resource Fair, uh, several of the pharmaceutical companies as well, so you can ask about their patient assistance programs that they have if you're on brand name medication and you have no insurance coverage. Um, so, I think now we, we can open it up for questions. Um, if anyone has any questions, we have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. I don't have a uh, question, but you talked about the relationship between doctor and patient. One of the things I think we should all expect is for the doctor to come in and take a seat. You know, not in a hurry. Let me talk to you and let me ask the questions that I need to ask. And you need to be prepared to tell the truth. Thanks. I agree. <laughs> um, Kristen and Taylor, it's interesting to me that as mother and daughter, you both have epilepsy. And to both you and the doctors, I'm wondering how common is it, or how uncommon is it, that this is genetic, that you're able to say? 
think, oh, um, I think it, just our general conversation, my suspicion is there is obviously a genetic um, aspect to this. Granted, we have many genetic tests nowadays specifically within that seizure continuum um, that we've discussed. Um, not everybody will have a positive result. It doesn't mean that you don't have that. It just simply means we're, we're just not smart enough yet to have all those pieces together. Um, time marches on. Uh, that wouldn't be something we would just close the book on. Who knows? In five years, in ten years, we don't know um, who will be able to gain more, gain more information. But it is, I wouldn't say very common, but we do see that certainly in our, um, our population, oftentimes, if not mom or dad, uncles, aunts, cousins, distant relations. So part of the family history is extremely important. And that is why, one other quick point, when you do come to your neurologist when we are asking family history, if you know that there are others who have had seizures in the past, what type of seizures were they called, or what did they look like? Were those individuals taking a seizure medicine? And if so, what was that medicine? Interestingly enough, the medication can give us a lot of clues as to what was going on. So just as a practical point, thank you. And our seizures, uh, there's nobody else actually in my family or uh, Michael's family that had seizures. But uh, when we went to Cleveland Clinic and we had studies done on both Taylor and I, um, what they're thinking is that epilepsy or the seizures are a symptom of something that is completely different, which has to do with estrogen levels. Um, on my side of the family, there are migraines, a lot of migraines on my side of the family, which is a, they call it estrogen something plus. So they're thinking that that might have something to do with it. And actually, when they said in about five to 10 years, we'll have a label or a name for what you have, and it won't be necessarily epilepsy, it will be this. And seizures are part of what show up with that. Um, um, yeah. The Epilepsy Foundation is doing to reduce uh, that stigma because the way, anytime that I go out in public, certainly nobody knows that I have epilepsy, but uh, I don't know if the Epilepsy Foundation is doing anything to reduce that stigma because I certainly feel stigmatized and Perhaps, like, I certainly feel uh, uh, like I'm obviously in a wheelchair, and perhaps that's the only way that anybody would know that I have any sort of illness of any kind. Um, but is there anything that right. the Epilepsy Foundation is doing to solve this stigma? Right, and you mentioned an important point. For, for many people, epilepsy is an invisible condition. It's not something you can see by looking at someone. So it's, uh, and people might look at you and say, well, you don't look like you have a disability. Why are you, why do you need a special help? Or why do you need, why are you struggling with something? Um, so yeah, we, Epilepsy Foundation in Michigan is right now, in fact, it's Epilepsy Awareness Month. So on Facebook, we're putting uh, epilepsy fact today. Every day of the month during November, we're putting up a fact about epilepsy to raise awareness. So we believe that education is the most important key to reducing stigma. Uh, the National Foundation is also doing a, a whole host of activities for Epilepsy Awareness Month. Um, uh, Cindy Hanford, our nurse, who's got the microphone, goes around and does just a ton of presentations uh, in the, to the public on epilepsy, seizure recognition, and first aid uh, in the schools. Uh, we go, uh, Gary, who has the other microphone, is doing them in, in uh, adult day centers so that awareness of epilepsy in the senior population is increased. So it is a major part of our mission, and, and um, you know, we're only limited by the number of staff we have. So uh, we, we want to do more, and we want to keep doing more. And, and you, can, as if you want to volunteer for the foundation, there's ways that we can get you to help us raise awareness, so, okay. You know, I have to have a special dedication with your doctor and a good relationship. And thank you, Dr. Amakasin, for being a dedication person that you are.
speak to the uh, stigma aspect of it. Um, I appreciate all that the Epilepsy Foundation and, and others like that do, but I really think that that taking care of that stigma starts with us. It starts with the, the person with epilepsy, the family of the person with epilepsy, to educate our own families as to what it is and the fact that it doesn't mean that somebody is stupid or, or that they, you know, they can fall down and try to get people. People need to understand epilepsy, but we are the ones who get to educate them. And if we've been given this disorder, whatever you want to call it, to deal with, then we've also been given the responsibility to educate those around us as to what it is, what's being done about it, and what they should do, and what they can't do, and how they can help. That's a really important part. Thank you. What's your name? I was surprised to find out from my daughter's school nurse that she covers 14 schools. It's really, really tough for them to get the word out. I sent away to the National Epilepsy Foundation for the school nurse education packet. They sent me 15, so I transferred those to her because she needs to train a lot of people. Right. And to me, it was very shocking that these school nurses are spread so thin. And the teachers are afraid of this because they don't understand it. So we really need to get the word out and parents need to check and see what's going on in your school system. Right. And, and take the initiative and give them the information that they need. And unfortunately in Michigan, we're, we're addressing this issue right now, Michigan has the lowest number of school nurses in the country per capita. So uh, it's not something we're proud of, and, but, but we do need to get, get the, the word out and um, the National Foundation is, is uh, doing it initiative now where our goal is to train 25,000 school nurses over the next two years. Um, and <clears throat> we've got really good buy-in from all the affiliates. We're working together to do that. So this is actually a major priority for us. And we have an online uh, training that has, offers continuing education credits. So um, that's that's one way that you can uh, train, uh, you know, if, if there's a limitation of the number of nurses, um, they can get training in this, through this program and hopefully then train others as well. Uh, another question? Okay. Uh, just, yes. uh, I'm Dr. Hasegawa, I'm an epileptologist in the Vermont Medi uh, Medical Center. Uh, I have to tell you, talking about the stigmatism, it was a big issue in the uh, annual conference of American Epilepsy Society five years ago, and there was extensive lecture. And I do not know who had had an implementation about that lecture, but I think it's a good time to talk about or uh, make that more effort for uh, the, the decrease of stigmatism in the uh, epilepsy community and society, and also deal with the burden of normality. Do you know what the burden of normality is? Can you explain that? The burden to normality is that the patient does not is not ready or adjust himself or herself for the normal life. Immediately back to that the cure or improvement of epilepsy. The patient failed to adjust the new situation, which patient back to normal. So this uh, issue is uh, unignorable and very significant. Even if the uh, epilepsy treatment is successful, the patient failed to adjust and that uh, back to normal life. And we have to uh, make an emphasis on uh, teaching that uh, dealing with the stigmatism and uh, burden of normalities. Right, so there's an assumption that once the seizures are over, for instance, if you have see, uh, surgery that's successful, that hey, you don't need any help anymore and, and everything's fine, but sometimes it can be difficult to adjust to not having to deal with the seizures and, and other people expecting you to be immediately back to normal. So that, that is an important point that is often overlooked. Um, thank you. Well, I also had, I don't know if it's a comment, st statement, or question, um, but it, I guess you can say it goes back to this um, the stigma about epilepsy with my son, he's 19, we're trying to get, I am trying to get him to be on his own. And I am really struggling with Social Security and Medicaid, and nobody wants to cover him because they don't have anything that physically that they can see is wrong with them. And I've been told a thousand times that people with epilepsy have normal lives, and 
but that's not the case for my son in particular. My son has several seizures every day, and he's on five different meds, and they're uncontrolled. And he can, you know, he can't live on his own, and I'm trying to make him independent, um, but there's just no resources there, really, that I've found. So, any comments about Medicaid or Social Security or... Um, well, maybe someone, uh, can anyone comment on, as far as Social Security applying for that? It's, there is a tendency sometimes to assume that epilepsy, again, because it's not a visible, obvious disability, to deny uh, that a person is, needs Social Security. So, um, what, are some, what are some things that, you can, that doctors can do and that patients can do to build that case. If you, if you really need Social Security, what, what types of documentation is needed? How do you successfully apply for it? You know, from a pediatric perspective, it sounds like, again, your physician needs to help you more in providing documentation and understanding as to what actually is going on and what the condition is and why this is not a reasonable expectation at this time for him in his life and in his journey. Um, and so that can come through a variety of ways. It can certainly come through letters. Um, that's generally what, what something I would do is uh, pointed letters over and above clinic notes. Um, I, I don't know if we have children's special health care to comment with that too, um, but it is extremely challenging. I will admit I don't know all the nuances of the social security and whatnot, but it seems to me just in a hearing that we as the physician can do possibly a little better job in the explanation and documentation as to why the support is needed. Right, and, and that means also including documentation on all these comorbidities that people might have, uh, memory problems, depression, medication side effects, uh, what the recovery time after seizures, not just during the seizures. So all of that needs to be documented to show that this person may not be able to work or may not be able to live independently at this point. So, um, and sometimes that's overlooked. As a simple letter stating patient has complex partial seizures that are intractable to medication, that doesn't paint a, the full picture. So it's having that sufficient documentation. Russ, if, if I may, from a, a personal level, uh, we were, I was raised that you took care of your own. And so my daughter is the one with epilepsy. It was years, and she was in her 20s before we decided, okay, you know, we're not getting any younger, so we're not going to be here to take care of her, go to the social security route. Automatically, and we've been told this, you're gonna be turned down the first time. It's just gonna happen. We went to the second route. I could not get an attorney to take the case because it's epilepsy. They're not going to take you. You remember back when it first started, you guys were talking about binders? Social Security Administration got two book, uh, the, the file folders full going back some 20 plus years of documentation to where they were going, whoa, stop. And I went, no, you need to see this. The other thing that happened is when we walked into that and finally got a second hearing, and it took three years, so don't give up. I walked in as an advocate for my daughter, which I had been all of her life. The judge was in Sacramento, we were in Grand Rapids, that was a lot of fun. Uh, they had a, a, a labor specialist there but it's you being able to advocate for your child and you being able to tell that story that no attorney can do for you. It, I mean, it, and it worked. We were 45 minutes into the conversation and the judge just put the gavel down and said, I'll make my ruling in two days. So don't give up. Uh, and advocate, you really do have to be an advocate for your child or for yourself. And again, those binders, without them, it would have never happened. Right. Thank you. Um, that's, sorry, that's my dad right there. And um, I will add a few things. The first time, I did not get the message saying that I was denied. It was after I 
I called him and said, I didn't get the message, the little sheet. And I was like, well, you can't appeal it. I said, well, I didn't get it. So I had to go back to Social Security and say, listen, I didn't get it. How can I appeal it? Right then and there, they said, let's do it again. That's how I got it. He was like, well, I'm not on my own. I'm still with my parents, but I'm trying. <laughs> I'm working at it, but I am with the foundation helping them out. So, but I am still working at it. Right. Persistence is important. <laughs> have time for a few more questions. Yeah. Hi, on the uh, topic of Social Security for your child, uh, sometimes an advocate, and there are professional advocates, and I I highly recommend Sharon Rossiter, who works in Michigan. She's not a lawyer, but she collected all the data and advocated for us in, a, in the hearing. And uh, it was right after Nicole's brain surgery, so she was sitting there with her hair all bound up. Well, she had no hair, but her head was all bound up in bandages, and she could barely walk after the surgery. And it still took binders and binders letters from all the doctors from her childhood, but luckily uh, she was given uh, Social Security via our Social Security, so it's only as a child, um, and she's an adult child now, not enough to live on her own and not enough to function if we were not here. So it's very, it's still very difficult. But another question I wanted to ask the um, assessment team was, you mentioned acupuncture and um, with Lamictal and Vimpat, with Lamictal and Nicole got se severe arm uh, clonic tonic seizure and flapping almost to the point where her muscles were hurting her so much. And I'm we were wondering if maybe um, and it's very interesting, we tried Vimpat, and the Vimpat did that with the leg, giving a clonic tonic reaction in one leg. And the aching of the muscles after lots and lots of clonic tonic seizures in just one part of your body. Um, I was wondering, did acupuncture help with certain aspects? Was it clonic tonic? And did you try physical therapy? I did not do physical therapy. Um, the acupuncture we used actually for seizure reduction is what we did. And we did cranial sacral um, for that too. After tonic clonic seizures, which is what both Taylor and I had. Um, yeah, very sore, it's like running a marathon and we hadn't had been training. Um, and severe headaches afterwards. We had not used it for pain management. Um, but I have heard that it has been used for that and, and been successful in some people. So hopefully that will. Um, not, no, not, well, you know, I don't know. I was having them erratically, so I don't know. I could have helped to reduce some. That was the problem. They were so idiopathic, tonic, tonic seizures, that's how they were given. So, and, and they weren't necessarily having a pattern at the time. So, they may have been working. It was helping to relax me, which was a good thing. I wasn't as stressed, but um, it didn't completely eliminate them. So we did it for a while, um, and, and that was helpful from a psychological standpoint, but it did not eliminate them from presenting. So. After our health and resource fair, one of the sessions you can choose from is complimentary, or complimentary therapies for epilepsy. So uh, that would be a good time to talk more about those types of things, not only as treatments for the seizures, but as possible ways to deal with some of the side effects, to deal with some of the uh, consequences of epilepsy um, as well. So, okay, uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, who's, who's, who's right here? The thing about managing and erasing the stigma is that we have to demand our respect, especially going to the ERs and what I've noticed in the Detroit area. Um, I've been accused of being a drug addict before, going into the hospitals, having seizures. I, I mean, blood is drawn just to see if I'm on drugs, and it's like, no, I'm epileptic. 
And it took going from being angry to demanding my respect, demanding respect from the Social Security, and as far as the Medicaid, I had to take tons of paperwork in so the state would cover me, so Social Security would see. We have to start demanding our respect, and that's the key thing to dealing with this. Because I'm not a drug addict, I'm a person who's epileptic, and I'm still a human being. I shouldn't be discriminated against. So once we start demanding that respect, it, it gets, I won't say easier, but you become stronger. And that's the key thing, you have to demand your respect. That's a good note. So, so, so I, I want to really thank our panelists. You, you provided a lot of great insights, and, and thank everyone who, who shared from the audience and a lot of great questions. And now it is time for lunch. So let's go and enjoy a healthy lunch and a health and resource fair. Um, and then we'll convene later. Thanks.